Hello, everybody. My name's Father Ed Thompson. I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 91 years ago. I was the first one out of a twin production for my mother and father. David, my beloved brother, younger brother, I used to call him, came eight minutes after I was born. We were born uh, to people who were ordinary. And my father was a traveling salesman. My mother, she was uh, a Kate McLaughlin, a real Irish lady. Maybe she was conceived in Ireland, but born in Philadelphia. When she was about to give birth to us, she was told that if she did give birth to us, she would either die or be afflicted with rheumatoid arthritis. So the suggestion was that she get rid of the two of us, but she didn't. And sure enough, when we were born, she contracted rheumatoid arthritis. But you know, she lived till she was 92. And when David and I went into the seminary, believe it or not, the pain left my mother. When she first received us in her arms after our birth, she told us that the first thing she did was take our little right hands and make the sign of the cross over our bodies. And we always claim as Catholic priests that it was because she started us off that way that we're doing the sign of the cross this way over God's people. We went to uh, Catholic grade school, Catholic high school. David was always uh, bigger than I. He was about an inch all over. If you set, saw us individually, you wouldn't know which one we were. Even my parents got mixed up with us. My mother rarely knew which one she was talking to when we were on the telephone together. My father once disciplined me. He says, now go out and tell Edward to come in. And I said, I'm Edward, Daddy. The other one's David. And he didn't have the heart to spank him the way he spanked me. He was so embarrassed. So it was in the fifth grade, when I was about 11, that I was given the gift of my priestly vocation. From there on in, even though I had distractions along the way, I was a normal kid in the community. I wasn't a pietistic kid. I didn't go around with the rosaries in my hand or bowing my head all the time. I played football and basketball and baseball like everybody else. In high school, I dated. I danced to Tommy Dorsey and Frank Sinatra at the Bellevue Stratford Hotel in Philadelphia. I had a steady girlfriend. I went to work for a year at Westinghouse. I tell people I went to work for a year and swore I'd never work again. I had a good job. I was making a lot of money. And we needed the money. It was around wartime. When I finally said to my mother and father, I want to be a Catholic priest. Now my twin brother, David, he went to the seminary to study for the priesthood the year before. I wasn't going to be dragged in because of my twinness with him. In fact, my father said, don't you have a mind of your own? Can't you be different from your twin brother? Go back to work, my mother said. We need the money. And the pastor in the parish said, I agree with your parents. I thought, what's going on here? I want to be a Catholic priest. And my parents are blocking me? They weren't. They were testing me. 
They wanted to make as sure as they could that I was doing it for the right reason. And once, I, I gotta tell you this, once I passed the examination for entrance into St. Charles Seminary in Philadelphia, I was on my way. Just a great big peace came over me in my life. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew what I had to do. The only hesitation I had was, would I be able to handle the studies to be a Catholic priest? And thanks be to God, I was given that gift. I never wanted to be anything else but a Catholic priest. And it's still there after 63 years. Oh, Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, our hero, David and I venerated him. We wanted to be like him. I like to say that the whole family became Sheen fiends, and especially David and I began to follow him, and so did my Aunt Mary. She followed him and caught what he was saying whenever he came in the Philadelphia area to give a speech. When we went to the seminary, we didn't have any radios in our rooms, but the dean had a radio, and he used to turn it up and we would sit at the doors of our rooms and listen to Bishop Sheen. I've read every book that Bishop Sheen ever wrote, and he wrote about 70 of them. And I keep reading them. He entertains me, but he inspires me. I understand him. He has the magnificent ability to take the very lofty and bring it down to the very lowly. He was a master preacher of God's word, and I always wanted to have his enthusiasm. I didn't want to imitate him. Here and there I do. But I wanted to have his enthusiasm for preaching. And so I have taken that, and my dear brother David, he took that seriously too. When David and I were exchanging thoughts about what we would say on Sunday sermon, and we did that every week, we'd say, what did Fulton say about this particular topic? Now, I got to meet him as a seminarian. David and I went to New York just to listen to him on the National Catholic Hour. Afterwards, he met with the people in the audience. And when he spied the two of us in our black seminarian outfits, he looked around the people in front of his seminarians. And he took another look, he said, twins. Oh, God love you. And he embraced us. And he says, whatever you do, persevere, persevere. Be good, holy Catholic priests. And so we kept following him. We fulfilled his command that we be Catholic priests. We hope we are holy. When I was a priest in the Philadelphia Archdiocese, on Vocation Sunday, I was charged by the Cardinal there to fill the church with those who would pray for vocations. And how did I do it? I got prominent speakers to come in to do it. I had Bishop Sheen come in twice, and he was magnificent, magnificent. One Sunday when Bishop Sheen was there, I also had Mother Teresa speaking in the evening at Benjamin Franklin Parkway up by the art museum where Rocky was up there waving his victory dance. I have to tell you a funny story about Bishop Sheen. 
He loved a good joke. So we were going, I was taking him after he had spoken to the cathedral. I was taking him to the Mount Vernon Retreat House to give us priests our annual priest uh, retreat. On the way, we went down Benjamin Franklin Parkway, and there is a statue of Rodin, the thinker. And in this histrionic way, as he came close to it, he says, look, Rodin. And I start laughing. He says, what are you laughing about? And I said, Bishop, do you know what the thinker is thinking? No, tell me. And I responded, where the hell did I leave my clothes? Well, I'll tell you, he laughed so hard, he left the Malmer. And he said, I will use that if you give me permission. And he did use it in the retreat to the priest, and he gave me credit. After being vocation director for 12 years in 1974, I was made a pastor in a church in Philadelphia. But I had a problem. It was a drinking problem. I was a real live alcoholic. I lasted only a year. I was so sick and so ashamed that after a year, I just left the parish. I went and worked in Florida for a year in a cemetery, selling grave, conducting funeral. Thanks be to God, my dear brother David never called me, never tried to rescue me. My mother used to get after him. Go after Edward, bring him back. David in his wisdom said, I'll go when he wants me. He'll know. And so after six months, I called. So I was working here in Florida. Clue. He said, I'll be right down. So he came down. And you know, he looked at me, he says, Edward, you're an alcoholic and you're a liar. Alcoholics, when they're drinking, cannot tell the truth. They can't survive telling the truth. And so that's when I joined AA. My brother arranged for me to go to Shelby, Ohio, to the religious house of the Sacred Heart Fathers and Brothers. And there I stayed to get my life back together again for over a year. I had a job every morning at five o'clock to go out and slop the pigs. So the prodigal son story was very much alive in my life. I was given a chance again to be a practicing priest out in Reno, Nevada. The bishop took me in, and after a year, he made me an official member of the diocese. And you know what I did? When I got the news, I celebrated by drinking a scotch. They didn't catch up to me until about a year later. And during the course of 15 years of being a priest in Nevada, I was sent to three six-month treatment centers. The money finally ran out. They couldn't spend any more money on the insurance company. So they put me in the last retreat house. And at the end of it, 
they told me we're saying goodbye to you. You'll have to make it on your own. About a month before I was discharged, kicked out, I received a letter from the Chancery from Reno, Las Vegas Diocese now. And they told me that a certain person was trying to get in touch with me. I didn't recognize the name. They wouldn't reveal to that person where I was, but they sent me that person's phone number. And if I wanted to get in touch with that person, I could. I didn't recognize the name. And I thought, well, let's try it. So I called it. And lo and behold, it was a person I met 30 years before as a vocation. She ran a Arthur Murray dancing studio. She was a gorgeous lady. I helped her get into the Carmelite systems. That's a story in itself. I said, why are you calling? She says, because Jesus Christ told me you were in trouble and I was to help you. She said, remember, you were the only one who believed me when I told you 30 years ago that Jesus and I talked to each other. She said, so now he talked again. I said, I thought you were a nun. She said, I got sick, I couldn't handle it. And out she came. Where was she living? Right here in Maitland, Florida, in the parish of St. Mary Magdalene. And so I said, I do need help. I have nowhere to go except to Florida. I've never been to me. Do you have any room in your home for me to like get a job and support myself? She said, yes. And so on July 19th, 1991, I landed in at the front door of that woman's house here in Maitland, Florida. I walked in, she said, here's your room. You know what was in the room? Four cats. And I was really afraid of cats. When I wound up cleaning their pens, cutting the grass there, going for the groceries because this woman was sick. She couldn't handle crowds. I was allowed to say mass all by myself. So I had an alley cat choir every time I said this. Eventually, I got out of there, went on my own, a studio apartment. I was given an opportunity to work in the parish. Most people did not know I was a priest. We trained all our servers, taught scripture, act as a sacristan, an elector, and eventually a miracle happened. Bishop Thomas Grady and Bishop, Bishop Norbert Dorsey prevailed upon the Bishop of Reno, Las Vegas to let me go and be a priest again. And for the last 23 years, I've had the joy of being a parish priest here at St. Mary Magdalene Parish. These have been 23 years of the happiest time in my whole priesthood, my whole life. This is such a caring community, a participating community. I've had the joy of being 
under the benign leadership of Father Charlie Mitchell, who has been the perfect pastor for me. He is my dear, dear friend, so much so that he and I have arranged to have our graves touching each other at San Pedro Priest Cemetery. It's been a joyful time. I'm living it now. I don't have the physical ability to do all the things I would like to do. Father Charlie gives me all the help that I need. So do all the people who come down. I offer Holy Mass, hear confessions, teach the scriptures, visit the sick, bury the dead. And I'll tell you, if I do those things and do them well, I have a wonderful priesthood. Dear folks, if there's one thing I want to say to you before I go into the next world, it would be this. Whatever you do, hold on to Jesus Christ in the most holy Eucharist Holy Communion. He is there. He is our religion. He is our holy church. Only the Catholic Church has Jesus in the most holy Eucharist. Hold on to him. Believe in him. Never let him slip out of your life. God love you.